in the days before selfies, this was a cool selfie. If you look close, you can see my mustache right there. Proud of it. I shaved my mustache off once and my wife didn't like it. So there's no question, the mustache stays. I'm Chris Hadfield. We're gonna look at some moments from my life that helped turn me into who I am today. That is Spaceship Atlantis. That's the nose of a, of a space shuttle. You can just barely see Atlantis written there. And that is my crew. This is my first space flight, uh, STS-74 in the fall of 1995. And we had just come up and docked with the space station Mir and we had built a part of Mir, and we were only docked for a few days. But I realized, hey, if we get the angles right, I could ask one of the Mir crew, one of the three people living on Mir, to get a camera and take a picture while we're docked. So we waited until we came around the world the right way so the sun was shining in our window. I spoke to Tomas Reiter, a German cosmonaut on board, the, international, or on board the, the Russian space station. It was like, okay, take a bunch of pictures, and then I went racing back down through all the tunnels into Atlantis and got everybody to stick their faces up into the sun. And it's incredibly bright. It's like sticking your head into an oven because there's nothing between you and the sun but that little pane of glass right there. So it couldn't be more scorching. An amazing human experience. In this picture, I think I'm about uh, five years old and inside a, uh, an instant Quaker Oats box. My dad took this picture of me. I've spent most of my life in a box. That's what we call the simulator as an astronaut. We call it the box. But just a few years after that, when, uh, when I got to be about nine years old, that's when the very first two people walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That little boy, just a few years later, that link between the fantasy of flying my little rocket ship box and the reality of three people climbing into a box and taking it to the moon and two of them climbing out of it and walking on the surface, it made me believe that impossible things can happen and that maybe that's something that I could even do. So when you see your kid playing in a box, uh, let them dream. That's my brother Dave and I leaning against my dad's Ford at Sarnia Airport. My dad was the very first pilot at Sarnia Airport. He was taking a friend flying and his friend in the back seat in a little old two-seat airplane and his friend was getting sick in the back. And my dad was like, oh, we're gonna land so we can throw up. And he saw this airport under construction. So he put his airplane down sort of next to the runway with the big X on it. And uh, the manager came out and said, hey, you can't land here. My dad said, well, look at this guy, he's throwing up. And they started talking and the guy offered him a job because my dad was a brand new flight instructor. And after my first space flight, um, they named the airport after me. And it's now Chris Hadfield Airport. I decided to be an astronaut when I was nine years old. And I had no idea how to be an astronaut. I mean, how do you make yourself into an astronaut? But I thought, astronauts fly. So I should learn to fly. So I joined Air Cadets at 13 years old. I studied leadership. I studied meteorology, all sorts of stuff. But then I passed all the exams and they chose me to, um, to become a glider pilot. I was only 15. This is graduation day. I had just qualified as a military jet pilot. There's a parade, you get your wings on your uniform and it, it, you can almost hear the sound of the doors opening in front of you of the choices that are about to come up as a result of work that you've done. And uh, our very first child had been born. Helena had given birth to him back in Ontario. She'd moved out to Moose Jaw. That's Kyle. A hugely proud day. Helena's so beautiful in this picture. It's a good day. I was a fighter pilot during the Cold War. And regularly, the Soviets would come into Canadian airspace. Sometimes they were just coming through the airspace on the way down to Cuba. Sometimes they would come into Canadian airspace to practice cruise missile launches on North America. Uh, so I was sleeping in a, an alert facility up in northern Quebec, and the horn would go off in the middle of the night, great blaring horn, and we would race, jump into our jets. We had to be airborne from dead sleep to uh, airborne in 12 minutes. We raced, got in our jets, we flew out, and found these two bear bombers. This was the very first F-18 intercept of a Soviet bear bomber. And here on the left side of the F-18, we have this great big light that I could turn on with my baby finger. So we came up in the dawn, I threw my light on, we could have a good look at it, see whether they have hostile intent that day. Um, we were fully armed, but they didn't have any hostile intent. They were peaceful that day. So there I am flying on Eric's wing, uh, trying to hold this enormous camera and focus and not bang it into the canopy and not crash into anybody as I'm, uh, as I'm trying to get this picture 
It was my first uh, role in combat. It was me right at the very edge where one little mistake, uh, one incorrect judgment could have huge international consequences. We just bumped the two nations next to each other for a little while and then we peeled away and I, they actually carried on and went down to Cuba. This picture was taken at Edwards Air Force Base in California where I went to test pilot school. And it's where uh, I had a chance to not only be an engineer and be a fighter pilot, but learn to be an engineering test pilot. The most demanding year of my life. Uh, I flew 32 different airplanes that year, had to write a huge report about each one, had to do all sorts of testing, an intensely demanding physical and mental year. And that night, I won the award as the top test pilot. And it was just so surreal, a real great feeling of proven reward for a huge amount of work. I was so pleased when I got hired as one of Canada's new astronauts that I wasn't the only one with a mustache. That's Dave Williams, and he's a, a bunch of different things, a pilot and a software engineer, but also a medical doctor. And that's uh, Mike McKay, who is a robotics engineer, and Julie Payette, who was an electrical engineer. And we are Canada's new astronauts. We had had a huge national competition, but finally for the four of us, it came down to the day that the president of the brand new Canadian Space Agency phoned us and said, we would like you to be one of Canada's astronauts. Uh, we'd only been astronauts for like minutes when this picture was taken. Oddly enough, one of the common questions is, what does an astronaut do between space flights? You know, as if we're like sitting in a waiting room or a lounge or something somewhere. But I was an astronaut for 21 years. I was only in space for six months. So for 20 and a half years, I was training and preparing and supporting other space flights. I did a bunch of jobs I was chief of robotics. I was uh, working in payload safety. I was chief of space station operations. I was NASA's director in Russia, but I was also someone who worked in mission control. I was a CAPCOM, capsule communicator, back when the spaceships were shaped like capsules. And when Houston wants to talk to a spaceship, you can't have 50 people on the radio. I was sort of the trusted agent for the crew on Earth. And I, I did that for 25 shuttle flights in a row. And I was NASA's chief Capcom. So I, I ran that whole side of things. It was the next best thing to space flight. When I was a little kid in a box, uh, the thing I really wanted to do was walk in space. Not just fly a spaceship, but go outside. And I was lucky enough to be asked to help build this huge piece of hardware, this enormous robotic arm called the Canada Arm, Canada Arm 2, in fact, onto the space station. Uh, Chris, your helmet cam view of the PGT looks like out of a training film. I'd been training for it for four and a half years, developing all the procedures and everything to be ready for this day when I was outside on a spacewalk helping to build the International Space Station. When suddenly, exactly when this picture was taken, one of my eyes was struck blind. And I was like, what's going on? And, and uh, my hand <laughs> came up to, to rub my eye. And of course, I'm wearing a helmet, went boink off the helmet. I was thinking, how stupid is that? Here I am, an astronaut. I don't even know I can't rub my eye. But the, without gravity, the tears didn't drain. They just, this irritated eyeball tear just got bigger and bigger and bigger until it, it started dribbling like a tiny waterfall into my other eye. And now both eyes were contaminated with something. And then I had to stop working because I couldn't see what I was doing anymore. I called down to Houston. And I'd worked in mission control as a Capcom, so I knew what a revelation that was gonna be for them to me to call down and say, Houston, hey, uh, I've got some problem and both my eyes are blind. What do you want me to do? And they thought maybe out of my backpack here where my air purification equipment was, maybe the chemical that takes the carbon dioxide out of the air, it's called lithium hydroxide, maybe that was getting in my eyes. So they said, open your purge valve. And right here on the left-hand side of my helmet, I could reach up and turn a little valve and let my oxygen hiss out into space. And at this moment, I am held in place by my feet on the end of an arm. I'm not touching anything else. I'm blind and I'm listening to tss as my oxygen is squirting out into space. And fortunately, that fresh oxygen blowing in on the back of my helmet 
was enough to start evaporating the big balls of tears around my eyes, start the crusty stuff around my eyes as it evaporated, blinking. Eventually I could start to see again. I told him I'm okay, shut my valve, and then I got back to work. And it turned out to be something really benign. It was just the, the, the anti-fog off my visor, it, 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 like a mixture of soap and oil had gotten into my eye. But since then we've changed the anti-fog. And so we learned from it. But it was, it was my very first spacewalk and a pretty interesting hurdle to have to cross while trying to do my very first walk. This picture is at Edwards Air Force Base at the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. It is uh, an extremely difficult year. You can see the pictures of all of the other graduates at airplanes that have been through that school. And, and when you're working really hard and studying really hard, you, you want a chance to, uh, to relax. And we had parties every week. But this guy in the cowboy hat, his name's Rick Husband, he was a commander of Columbia. Commander Rick Husband. Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. And in uh, 2003, uh, when Rick and his crew were coming back down through the atmosphere, they'd had damage during launch. And we all knew the vehicle was damaged, but nobody knew how badly. Coming back down through the atmosphere, that hole in the left wing uh, allowed the huge heat and pressure of, of the plasma field around the vehicle to go into the wing and melt the spar and burn up everything inside the wing. The left wing came off and the vehicle tumbled and came apart and Rick and all his crew were killed. It was the result of our own decision making. You know, we, we knew that his ship was damaged, but we sort of said, well, we don't know how badly it's damaged and we really can't sort of do anything anyway. So let's just assume it's okay. We didn't even ask them to go outside on a spacewalk to crawl over the big door of the shuttle and look around and see how big the hole in the wing was. If we had moved heaven and earth, maybe there would have been a way to, to rescue them. And a couple of years later, when we changed a lot of things uh, and the next shuttle flew, it was triumphant, sort of a, a way to venerate Rick and his crew. And every ship that has ever flown in space since then has been better because of the sacrifice that Rick made. But I'm glad we got a chance to sing together too. This is a Soyuz spaceship. It's the third spaceship that I flew after twice on, on space shuttles, Atlantis and Endeavour. This is the workhorse of taking people to the space station and back. Soyuz, it's a Russian word for a union, Sovietsky Soyuz, Soviet Union. Uh, because it unifies the Earth and the space station. And it's just barely big enough for three people. And it's just a tiny little capsule. You want to make it as small as possible because that makes it easier to push into space. If you're claustrophobic, uh, this would not be a good job. I mean, that's, that's business class on a Soyuz right there. That's as good as it's going to get. I was real lucky to be the, uh, like the pilot or the co-pilot of the Soyuz. And, uh, and it was a great way to get to space and a real nice, tough, safe, reliable way to get back to Earth. This is a still from a YouTube video. In a most peculiar way, and, the stars look and that guitar is a Larry Vey acoustic guitar, a parlor guitar made in Vancouver, Canada, and it is up on the space station right now. In fact, it's been up there since the summer of 2001, and it's put there because lots of astronauts are musicians and we're a long way from home. And it's nice on holidays and at, e at parties in the evening, you know, when you're just trying to be a group of people to play songs that we all love and know. And my son, who was really helping me with social media, my son Evan, said, Dad, you should do a version of Space Oddity. And I was like, Space Oddity? If you can't cover Bowie, you know, it's like covering Bach or covering Supertramp or something, it's not gonna happen. And besides, Space Oddity is about an astronaut dying in space. I don't wanna sing that, I'm living up here. But my son, far wiser in these things than I am, he said, Dad, I'll rewrite the words for you, but you should just do it. It's, it's a classic tune, lots of people want you to just make a version of it. So I, I floated in my little sleeping pod and uh, just did a little karaoke along with David, listening to him in one ear, singing into the microphone. But then Evan, my son, weighed back in and said, Dad, it's gotta be video. You know, you're in space. No one's gonna believe it if you don't have a video. But <laughs> I was like, Evan, I'm the commander of a spaceship. I'm busy up here, you know, I, I, uh, I, I can't. He said, if you don't do it, you will regret it for the rest of your life. 
So I'm like, okay. So a Saturday afternoon when I was supposed to be doing something else, I set this up. And I, uh, I took a camera and I just like uh, Velcroed it to the wall, hit record. I had a little uh, iPad playing of the nice audio track that I'd done with Em and Joe. And I just sang along with myself and did it floating. And it took about, I don't know, an hour and a half, floating around different places in the station, sing along with myself here, sing along over there, float the guitar down the, the Japanese module here and, and float around and just sing along once with myself. And then I shipped it all down to the world. This is ground control to Major Tom. You've really made We got permission from Bowie and his organization who loved the audio track. But on the night before I came home, the video was done and Evan released it to the world. And, and this video, um, by the time I landed, like 12 hours later, had been seen seven million times. And, but for me, the best part was that Bowie loved it. He, he saw it. He said it was you know, maybe the most poignant version of the song ever done. Uh, I never got to meet him in person. I wish I had. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted that Evan talked me into doing this. I'm proud of how the song came out. But for me, the best part was that uh, David Bowie finally got to fly in space, which he'd always dreamed of. I hope uh, you enjoyed looking at these pictures with me. You should do that. Sit down and go through pictures and remind yourself of the special moments in your life.